you're not missing out on anything because as soon as you enter the fund world or anything to do with the SEC, um, your compliance becomes of top priority. Not only yes. for you, but you also have, also have responsibility for your investors. So it's it's always while uh, while yes, the portal and investors great. In- Hello, you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Brandon Elliott. We got somebody that from New York to Florida just recently moved to Florida, but has been focusing since 2019 as a real estate agent in New York. Still, I believe, holds his license as a broker and so forth, but really felt the need to help out his clients more by giving them opportunities to put their capital to work in different investment opportunities. He actually started in 2023, just last year, about 18 months ago, really focusing on setting up a fund and becoming a fund manager and helping out over 45 different investors currently and raising a little north of $5 million has been focusing on several different projects and putting it to work. So I'm excited to hear the journey from you know, where you originally came from to like with that mindset of real estate and agent to where you're at today and kind of what sparked up all that. But uh, Nishant, how are you today, brother? I'm doing well and uh, I'm really excited to be here, Brandon. Thanks for having me over and uh, big hello to your audience as well. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. So talk to us. Why real estate? You jumped in in 2019. And, and for anybody, I guess, out there that doesn't know, like more of a 30,000 foot view of, of who you are, where you're from, what you're up to, that would be great. Shut up. Actually, I was born in the US, but I grew up in India. So it's only in 2018, uh, when I was 29, I came to the US. And being a US citizen, I always had this dream back of my mind that at least I want to go to the US once and give it a shot and see how life is over there. This so was I it, up was it in New York. Was it New York that you were from? Yes, I was born in uh, Long Island, New York. I was there yeah. for the first couple of years and my parents decided to move to India at that time. So yeah. 2018, I came to the US and for the first 12 months, I was hustling to get a job. I got a job in a healthcare startup, but I was just really enamored by seeing those The big buildings, the dreams, uh, New York City, you know, the energy, everything, the hustle, the culture over there. And I started to attend conferences in Times Square and going to, you know, buying $10 tickets and just learning more and more about the world of real estate. And I just saw that there's so many opportunities from wholesaling and fix and flipping. You can become a broker. There's so many ways you can really get involved, multifamily investing in the real estate space. And I started to dig deep into YouTube videos and I saw there's just so much opportunity here. And early 2019, I was still doing a job. I didn't have, I, you know, the kind of <laughs> capital, at least at least my limiting belief that time was I need a lot of capital to get into real estate investing. And so I think everybody, I easiest... though, right? Like every, everybody thinks <laughs> that originally. I need a ton of money to get started in real estate. And that isn't always the case. Exactly. And, you know, it didn't realize how much sweat equity and hustle really goes in. So I thought at that point, you know, okay, I'm in Manhattan. What can I best leverage? thousand dollars start a fees to get up to get a real estate license didn't seem really expensive and if i had the opportunity to start selling a million dollar homes so that's when i jumped in i jumped in straight up so i didn't have any network or anything like that <laughs> i ross underestimated how difficult it will be because i just thought that people are willing to hire me to sell their homes and i'm going to be this guy coming on television now yeah but um, <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult hard, than that right it's a little bit more difficult a lot than that. more yeah, <laughs> a lot more. And, and there's sharks sitting over there already in you know, and, and, and every real estate market, in fact, in the U.S. So yep. 2019 was hard. 2020, of course, COVID. But by the end of 2020, I got a good traction, I built a good practice, 21, 22. But, you know, one thing which kept coming up again and again was that I was trying, I was looking, why it was very fulfilling being a, a real estate agent in um, in New York City. And, you know, it's, it's good fun selling those expensive properties, meeting highly successful clients, but I saw a bigger problem statement because most of my clients were in the tri-state region, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and 
uh, people are wanting to do something in real estate outside the tri-state region because yeah. New York and New Jersey are fundamentally expensive markets. So yep. what do you look at? People want to do something in Texas, you want to do something in Florida and you just keep hearing things and almost every time I would get up, like both personally and professionally, my clients or friends would ask me, hey, do you know of any good deals? I have this extra 50K or 100K lying with me and I want to do something real estate, but I'm busy. I don't want to be a landlord. I want cash flow. So I saw a consistent pattern and that's when I, and also when the mortgage rates were rising, I saw this as an opportunity that I could potentially pivot from and being a real estate agent to helping a bigger audience, uh, potentially throughout the US, maybe international as well, to start investing in commercial real estate. So that, that's kind of my journey from an agent to now a fund manager. You know, the, the, the natural aspect of being a real estate agent is you build a network. And sure. then you, you, if you can start addressing that network and scale, you can, you can expand into different avenues. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how like, so in a lot of those states right there, they're all blue states and all the, all the investors really want to invest out of state into red states to really right. get the, the best bang for their buck, plus the security and safety on the investment. So when it comes down to the agent side of things, are you still doing that today? I know you are still licensed, correct? Yes, I am. So I just have another year, 12 I think in another 12 more months. So of okay. course, when you've been in the business for about five years, you do build some goodwill. I have a good network. So I have partnered yeah. with other agents to help, help with showings, et cetera. But I'm not really actively prospecting for new business. So it's not that yeah. I'm actively marketing or spending energy, you know, calling up for referrals. I use the same energy to get in touch with my network though, but for more activities to do with investing in syndication projects uh, across the Sun Belt region. Okay. And then are you planning on extending your license and, you know, keep paying the renewal as well as where did you hang your, your license originally? So I started off with Keller Williams in 2019, but oh. now I'm with Compass and okay. Keller is great brokerage for training, but you know, I, I moved on to Compass. I don't plan to say something which I'm still visiting because I want to be uh, laser focused in the fund management business, but there's a high probability that because of the goodwill I've built, I make greater referral model where I can, if any clients, uh, when you know, ask clients are looking for people to buy in New York, they can always refer them to my colleagues in the industry and potentially work through a referral fee. And that way also gives me an opportunity to be involved at some level, right? To know what's happening in their deal. I think I, I value those aspects, but my focus lot now is on multifamily. Okay. And then how many transactions did you do as a real estate agent before deciding to switch over as a fund manager? Sure. That's a good question. So I've, in the last four years or so, since I've been a full-time agent, I did somewhere around 40 transactions. New York City transactions take slightly longer than your typical ones because uh, we have process of co-ops, condominiums, just to let your audience know the sentient application process before you buy a home, just add another two months to it can be a lot more tedious as well. Um, also, price points are a lot higher, somewhere between one to $3 million. I know I've given a big range, but typically that's where uh, most homes you're selling. So your sales cycle is slightly longer. But yeah, that's that, that's the range. Uh, mostly been a buyer's agent, um, yep. which I've enjoyed a lot, actually. Um, so I've had a good time being a buyer's agent in Manhattan. You get to see all great properties from, you know, I've been blessed to sell from a studio 500K to all the way to a $4 million uh, penthouse in uh, uh, Manhattan. And the reason I say this is that I think the biggest learning for me in working in a market like Manhattan was just meeting a highly successful clients, you know, people yeah. who are executives in Fortune 500 business owners. And Manhattan kind of is that melting point, right, for people coming between New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, even, may I even say, even Philadelphia for that matter, people people yeah. pour into New York every day. So I think that learning is something which which has really stayed with me. Yeah. And did you have any friends or family members that encouraged you to do real estate or how did you get inspired besides just doing research and realizing like there's money to be made in real estate? Actually, they weren't uh, the most excited when I started off because 2019 is when I got married and it was just 12 months since I moved to a new country. And in 2000, so they wanted something more uh, stale, possibly me working maybe in a consulting job in New York. At least that's what they envisioned or or, uh, or some tech company because I'd done my MBA previously. So then mindset comes, okay, if you've done an MBA, yeah, you should be in a good corporate job. Why would you worry about real estate? And let alone start with brokerage. So Starting off with brokerage, at least in India, was slightly frowned upon in, in, in the real estate hierarchy of things. You know, like really? 
if you, yeah, maybe developers on top or investor, they're like, okay, because just being a real estate broker seen as a very saturated commoditized business, whereas it's a slight, slightly different in the US. I think it's, it's a highly lucrative business because you can really build a good network. You can own a good farm as well or in terms of where you're living or any area you choose for. And this or they, to some extent, there can be some scale as well if you're able to build the systems into place. So it was slightly different because here in the US, the difference is this, this, the culture of teams that would come up, real estate brokers really advertising themselves. They're almost mini businesses within a brokerage, right? Because they're all independent contractors. Whereas more in India, it was see slightly more commoditized. It's only now post-COVID that the culture in India has also started where you'll see real estate brokers using social media like uh, YouTube or having, you know, successful podcasts like yourself. So seeing, seeing that trend now, but um, yeah, at least at least 2019, it wasn't, they weren't really excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's funny to say, you know, feeling like it's oversaturated, you know, just because everything I feel like is oversaturated these days, right? There, sure. there isn't one thing that hasn't been done a million times, but success leaves clues and you don't always need to reinvent the wheel to be able to hit success. And so it's awesome how you followed your heart. And even though you have your MBA and you, you have all these other things that can really set you up for a tremendous future, it gives you options and you don't need to necessarily jump in that still while you're young, jump into some, uh, you know, following your heart and realizing real estate. So, so at this point you set up the funds early 2023 and you've raised a little over $5 million so far through 45 plus different investors. How was the process to set up the fund in general? Was it just sitting down with a certain lawyer, paying the money for it and, and keep it moving? Or what was the education experience, possibly learning curves involved? Sure. No, that's a great question. Actually, I was fortunate that I was able to build that fund through a platform called Avestor. And um, they, they do the legwork to help you not only build a fund, but get the attorneys involved to get all your paperwork in order, et cetera. And they, they provide in create online portal as well. So where you can streamline your operations by investors being in one place, they may be able to see your different deals. So I was lucky that I was able to hire a company that almost gave me into end sales as well. So they were also speak to me about it offline from your audience. You know, I'm happy to chat about it. But just to give you a gist of what it is, so how it was built is a customizable fund. And what that means is that there's one set of fund documents which are evergreen and Every time a new deal comes, it's like a new exhibit, which you can keep adding on. So you enter the fund, but you get to choose which deal you want to invest in. So it kind of gives you the benefit of you investing in single assets within a fund versus it being a blind pool fund, if that makes sense. Because based on feedback, which I got from a lot of retail investors, uh, retail investors still like to be involved picking on their own projects. For example, they may have done something in Dallas, but they want to go through the webinar. They want to understand, see the deal brochure. They want to know, okay, it's a 200, 300 unit complex. There's a story about it, blah, blah, blah. So I think that educational aspect and the ability for investors to choose based on feedback, I really like the model of having fund, but giving you the benefit of a syndication where you where you pick up pick on a deal basis. So that's how the fund structure was. Luckily, um, you know, as I said, luckily for me, I had a good attorney who just helped me through the do documents. Um, the company and the CEO of the team was pretty helpful in terms of setting me up in terms of the systems and legal so that I could do what I enjoy the most, which is talking to investors, creating educational content material for them and have the experts do what they are good at. Yeah. That makes sense. So you used a company, a vester, and uh, yes. and do they take a like do they take a piece of the company or anything, or is it just a, a flat fee that you pay one time? Sure. So just just to give you you know your audience some perspective, give or take those startup costs is around eighteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars. If you go to through the a vester portal, so about ten thousand dollars, which is a negotiated rate, which from an attorney, which could have been. 20 plus, but because they're doing that at scale, you, you get a discount and about eight to ten thousand dollars are their startup initiation fees. And then you pay small monthly fees every month to the portal based on how much capital you've raised. So of course, as your business grows, your fees also increases. 
but that's in direct proportion to how you're growing, right? To just just to give context, I think the startup fee is between eighty and twenty thousand. But good news in a fund business is that investors who are coming on board understand that because just the, the good legal documents and everything which you're creating, good portal is something which is of good use to everybody. So yeah. you have investors also contributing to it to to help you run it successfully. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you want a good fulfillment, you know, funnel so that people can actually see where their money's at, updates and so forth. How often are you giving updates? So we like to give monthly updates as much as possible, though I look from my perspective because I'm a limited partner investor myself. Essentially, I'm not boots on ground and the general partners, they're the ones who are doing all the legwork. So I'm getting monthly updates, quarterly updates, which I share with my investors, my feel more value in quarterly updates, the only reason being that there's a baseline to compare, right? Because on monthly basis, just it's just too yeah. soon to see any big delta. Progress. So I think the quarterly, yeah. exactly. So I think quarterly updates is good. Sure, while I do appreciate in, in general partners sharing monthly updates, kind of holds them accountable. I think from an investor perspective, it's also important to give, give them enough time to work on the project and make substantial improvements so you can hold them accountable accordingly. Yeah, there's only so much that can get done in one month when you're talking about big projects. So yeah, exactly. give, give it 90 days and you can actually see some traction and, and some efforts and energy moving in the right direction. Absolutely. I love that. And then so so you're mentioning with Avestor, it's about 18,000 to 20,000 to get started. And then after that, there is a monthly fee to have the portal and, and keep everything existing. And then what what is the percentage that they are holding on the monthly basis that they're charging? And then at the end of the day, the type of fund that you have here, what reg is it? So we are doing a Pfizer 6C fund, so it's primarily for accredited investors only. So I can do uh, accredited investors, just, you know, let your audience also know is that anyone who's making over $200,000 a year or husband and wife combined making $300,000 a year or you own um, real estate worth a million dollars apart from your primary home. So essentially, most people qualify in the first or second scenario or I also do Pfizer 6B funds, which are Pfizer 6B funds. Essentially, you don't need to qualify for these three financial scenarios, but there has to be a pre-existing relationship. So for example, maybe if an investor and I have had already a phone call before and there's some kind of relationship established, plus some email exchange, essentially what the SEC is trying to see is that you're not soliciting someone without a relationship. Yeah. Right? If the relationship is established, there's some level of confidence already going. In that case... You don't need to necessarily meet this criteria, but I still can only work with accredited investors in my fund. At least that's how I've done it. And there's reasoning for it as well, because most of my deals have a minimum of $50,000. And that's quite a sizable check if by, by all means, because for some investors, of course, I've had investors come at one fifty to 200000 plus as well. But, you know, for, for first investments, 50 plus K can be sizable. So it's important uh, I feel that, you know, you, you qualified in a certain realm. I believe SEC might also be adding an exam in the future, just in case you don't qualify financially actually by giving the exam your, you know, you, you, you should understand your investment because these investments come with risks. Yes, yes. And then so 50K minimum, does Avestor help out with the uh, tax filings or payouts and so forth within the portal? Or is that just bookkeeping, tax filing and, and so forth? Uh, they do. So we are very fortunate because they're able to help us. In to, they do the bookkeeping. Of course, we need to, you know, we need to have a, we need to overlook it as well. But they also do the tax filing in terms of sending k ones to investors. So K-1s yeah. are showing your, your profit losses for your investment. They help you in the distribution. So a lot of it gets streamlined. Of course, as you're growing and scaling and the number of investors you're dealing with are increasing, you need to get in more help just to make sure the customer experience is good and you're not missing out on anything because as soon as you enter the fund world or anything to do with the SEC, your compliance becomes a top priority. Not only yes. for you, but you also have, also have responsibility for your investors. So it's it's always, while, uh, while yes, the portal and AVST is great in terms of, you know, doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but I think from a fund man responsible fund manager's perspective, uh, at least how I look at it is, we need to have our own team to be checking and making sure because we don't want our you don't want our fund to be coming under any compliance issues, nor do we want our investors to have any problems. Yes, that makes sense. 
Okay. And then, so talk to me about some of the deals that you've invested in so far. Uh, Cause I mean, the fund is somewhat new a year and a half. How many deals have you invested in and where do you find the partnerships, you know, cause you're, you're bringing the capital to the table. You raise the, the funds. So now it's your job to find some good partners that actually have great opportunities, right? Absolutely. I think that's Primarily from an investor's perspective, why they work with fund managers is because they want vetted opportunities. So they yes. want to make sure that you as a fund manager probably evaluate, get 100 deals on your desk and maybe two pass your litmus test. Okay, just, yep. just give me an example. And it's actually true. Second is, you know, you have an in a due diligence process in place set where you have a certain level of checklist which you go through to ensure. And, and again, I'm happy to discuss more in detail as well. So that of the deal passes then. And finally, and probably the most importantly, well, what's in it for the investor? Because, hey, am I getting preferential economics or somewhere of a better split working with you than going to the operator? And I think that's that's important for investors to know that a, you know, a fund like mine comes, if you're coming with 500K a million or $2 million in a deal, you tend to have slightly more negotiation power with, with the operator. Just to answer your question in terms of how we're looking for deals, so I do a top-down approach first and foremost is identifying your markets. It's very important and it's important to be disciplined as well. So I kind of keep a very simple approach and then complicated. I look at U-Haul and I see which, is the, which are the states where people are migrating to most. Basic data information I look into because end of the day, real estate is a location-driven business. Yeah, if People are migrating, job growth is taking place, there's going to be more demand. So you want to meet okay. that demand, right? So, so that's a big takeaway that people should be writing notes on this because you just dropped some gold right there. Looking at certain places like U-Haul, right? Or budget truck or whatever. You know, where are these trucks? Where are people moving to? And, and where are they doing the one-way trips, right? And so that's where you're going to find job growth, population growth. You're going to find something unique about that area that you want that is a, a good leading indication of, hey, this may be a, a nice area, a nice location that we should consider investing. So how do you find that type of data? Sure. So how I, I stick with it is that I have a few criteria which I look into. Like you mentioned, first you want to look at states which are more landlord friendly, especially if you're going to multifamily rentals. Okay, if you're going to new development yeah. condo sales, that's different. And that's a, that's a very small market which I work on. But so based on that, the markets I have really boiled down to is Texas, Florida, those hard to pencil these in Florida nowadays, North South Carolina and Phoenix. Yeah. And now once you're able to identify your states, you want to identify certain locations like Dallas, Houston, Charlotte, Phoenix. Okay, another filter. Then I keep throwing on these filters out there. Now I once have identified my markets, I need to find the top players out there. How do I identify the top players now? That's the next question. Great place to go for uh, conferences because that's a good opportunity to to meet operators over there in person to person. Just something for your audience as well. The larger these real estate projects, it's better that uh, they are locally based. So because I've been a broker myself, I understand the importance of a local knowledge and expertise. You can be, if I was in New York City, I was just good in selling maybe Upper East Side Manhattan. I didn't know all the five boroughs, for example. Yeah. Right? So, uh, if I'm working somewhere in Dallas, what's your track record in Dallas? Do you have your own property management, your own construction? How many deals are you exited? What the kind of returns you give to investors? So if you have a few filters which we look into that, okay, we are probably a top five player in that market. Also, I'm part of a fund management fund managers group where we are about 100 fund managers and other different GPs come on a weekly basis to pitch their deals. And then we as a group do due diligence together and negotiate better splits. So this this way, good deal flow is also coming and be able to compare different deals before we send anything across. Also, if many a times when I've identified a very good sponsor, I reach out to them directly. Yep. And I reach out to them directly through LinkedIn. Um, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to, you know, find people's contact information through podcasts. And, you know, you can always initiate a conversation to see that, okay, they're looking for good capital because that's going to help them scale as well as we're looking for good projects. So, you know, there are different avenues, I would say, but the fundamentals remain that, okay, are you locally based? How much of it are you doing things in-house? What's your track record? You yep. know, have you done, I, I really don't want to be, I don't want to be a first play. I respect, you know, I respect, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur myself, but I, I don't want to be the first, second shot for you to give it a, you know, for you to yep. try this. You should have done this 
quite a few times successfully and for us to at least have a conversation. Yeah. If they have failed in the past on something, is that something that you will acknowledge and still work with? Or what is, you know, what what's your track record with that? So uh, from my perspective is that I don't like to work with GDs who have lost money because yep. that's a red flag for me. I also tend to avoid GPs who do capital calls. Capital calls just to give context to the investors. Let's say I raise money from a bunch of investors or project, you're in a certain budget, but you've just your your budget's gone haywire and you need more money to just pay your debt. So just keep the project running. So that that doesn't give me much confidence because at that time it shows that you know you you really didn't factor different external factors in. You won't, you definitely won't come the way in your approach. Yeah. So I'm okay if you know you've had certain deals which have not hit your targets, but I want to know the story behind it. Yeah. Were, were you able to sell it before the mortgage rates went high? Great. I gave investors less return, but I gave a faster return. That shows me confidence. Is your overall average return still high? Okay. That gives me confidence as well because sure, out of 10 projects, if two haven't done as well as if you like, you know, three to four are going to hit another park. By and large, is your portfolio giving about average market returns? Because these are end of the day, private equity projects, right? These are private real estate investment placements for investors. So they are not looking for returns which they can get in public markets. You have to beat that. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to be giving returns similar to S&P 500, why would they be interested in investing with you when they could go for a much safer option out there, right? So you need sure. to give something which is a lot more compelling to them. So yeah, I, I'm not putting against if you don't hit your goals, your projections, but at least I need to know the story and I need you to acknowledge it. Yep. What What about the last several years when interest rates just started going crazy? Like a lot of the multifamily markets and syndicators they had a lot of issues. They they weren't betting that the interest rates were going to do what they did. And so, and I know they've been promising for a long time now that the interest rates are going to start coming down. We've seen a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I'm curious. There, there were several companies out there that were doing capital calls or going under, you know, and, and having some issues. And, and I'm assuming that there's going to be many more. But what are your thoughts on that? That's a great point because what happened in 2020-21 also, if, if I may add, was when the interest rates were down, the market was on fire, right? You're getting extremely low cap rates. You're getting the kind of pricing you could ask for, quick turnarounds, a low entry barrier into the business in terms of syndicators, more and more syndicators were coming in, new multifamily operators coming. I think that was a problem because when the times are good, people assume it's always going to be good. And a lot of these folks came in floating rate debt. Is and she just to give your audience perspective is, uh, they they as you know the interest rates to be you know variation interest rates based on how the market is going. So when the rates started to go up, they didn't really factor that in, and it gets hard for them to pay your loan back, right? So also rents were not going up in the last years the way they wanted to. So now what's become a situation is that a lot of new players are getting washed out. Who, who didn't plan for this. And this has actually opened up an opportunity because, for example, KKR has recently taken a $2, $2 billion bet on multifamily. They've done, I believe, 18 purchases recently. A lot of the big firms like Blackstone are sitting with dry powder to buy a lot of distressed real estate. We've recently done two distressed deals and we have one coming up again. Yep. Uh, just to give context, distressed is when uh, sellers are forced to make a sale by the lender because they break a few debt covenants. It could be your expenses have gone a lot higher than the ratio, which is acceptable. Uh, that essentially puts the deal on risk. You've not been able to service your debts, things of things of that nature. Lenders come into foreclosure situations. So at this point, as we're recording this podcast, we are looking at pricing from the peak of 2022. In April, multifamily is down by about 20, 25%. So you know, you're able to buy at big discounts, but obviously getting loans now a lot harder, raising capital is a lot harder. So these are the factors one may one has to also consider. But if you look at the from the opportunity side, new construction multifamily is done by 50% from last year. I recognize they've given a very big statistic, uh, largely because of where interest rates, inflation go. It's very hard for numbers to really pencil down. Yeah. But what we are foreseeing in the market is that in the next two years, as in when rates will potentially come down, home affordability is going to start getting more out of reach. 
uh, rents are going to start coming high in the next two years or so, uh, we'll then under supply market potentially. So it's a cliche, you know, yeah. buy when it's, it's a like, can't mouse buy, game. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a cliche, buy when it's, there's blood on the street, as they say, oh, it's a buyer's market, but you know, it's, it's a cliche for a reason because it's true. There is that kind of opportunity right now. But again, it's, being in this space for five years, especially working with different buyers' emotions, buyers and investors, buyers tend not to kind of when there's a falling knife situation. You don't want to be, you you don't want to be buying when you think that you know things have fallen down. But there is opportunity. Yeah, I love that. So your predictions are in the next year to two years, interest rates will come down a little, but that will also bring a lot of people onto the market, making the pricing kind of bid wars going higher. Correct. Yes, I do foresee that in the next two years. Simply, uh, just from a demand supply perspective, right? We are not from using a U.S. housing perspective. What? Just, just to give another context. In about a few months ago, Fox News uh, and I, I, or Redfin, you know, one one of these sources, and I'm right about it. They gave a report saying that home affordability in the U.S. is the worst in the last forty years. Uh, that's 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 quite that that that's a very big. Uh, report and the reason they said was that what happened in 2020 was they went mortgage rates were at three percent about 70 percent of homeowners now in the u.s have lost their rate you know below five percent or four percent yep. so those folks aren't really incentivized to list at that time in fact home prices have gone up in the last year because we've been in a low supply market by two or three percent yep. and what happened in 2020 is that home prices went up by 20 or percent 20 25 percent give or take now, they have not really come down. So the statistic we said in the journey was that to buy a median home in the U.S., you, a family need to, needed about $85,000. Now they need to make $120,000. So to get home affordability back to where it was, either mortgage rates need to come down at 3%, home prices need to fall down by 20%, or, you, or your yearly income needs to jump up by 60%, or a combination of these three, ideally, for it to become affordable again. So... From 7% mortgage rates, we don't see it falling down to 5% in case not overnight. Uh, we don't see any indication that there's going to be a market crash. In fact, you know, market experts feel that once mortgage rates starts falling down, there's going to be a lot of pent-up demand and in fact, home prices are going to go up. So a lot of people feel it might become a situation like Europe. What really separated the U.S. from the European nations was that all the portability was very much intact over here. But in, in Europe, if you go to any of the major metros, uh, you tend not, you can't really afford there or the, you know, the, uh, afford that unless you have an inherited home. We don't want to be in that situation, but it seems we are, we're kind of headed there. So people are choosing to rent for lifestyle reasons and all affordability reasons. Uh, but I think the next three years will be from 26 onwards, 26, 27 will be very powerful for the multi family market. Yeah, that's good. And then, so what if, you know, when you're raising capital and you have $5 million on the plate right now, you know, what if you don't have an opportunity to put to the money to work right away? Are you raising the capital after you get the opportunities or are you just having it in the funds sitting there waiting? And is it earning anything? It's it's not a debt type of fund, correct? It, it's more of a equity fund, correct? It's, it's, it's an equity fund. I haven't done a uh, grant that you get, but uh, I raise on a deal to deal basis. Okay. So just to give your audience perspective, it's like, let's say only once the deal has been finalized, not only from GP means the guys were doing, uh, we're, we're getting the deal together. But also from my perspective, once I'm going through my YouTube checklist, my vetting process, and I am confident about the deal, it's at that time I presented to my investors. So I don't like to do more than two deals, one to two deals per quarter. And the reason being is that and not more than one deal at a given point of time. The reason being is that if, if you're getting an email or a phone call from me, it should be like, okay, this is a vetted opportunity. At least it's worth me reviewing it. Yeah. If I send these on a weekly basis, then it comes more from a commission breadth perspective. I think that's my view. So uh, to answer your question, we raise after the deal comes. So I'm raising on a per deal basis as soon as the investors invest yeah. into our fund, we, we, we go and uh, invest into that. And then are you prior, just when you're out there networking, you are kind of building relationships and 
getting verbal commitments beforehand. I'm, I'm curious, what is the actual percentage of people that say they're going to do it? And then when it actually comes time on the deal, you know, deal to deal basis, not every deal is made for every person, but is it closer to 50% or so that actually decide that once upon a time told you, yes, I'm interested, send me the next one, I'm, I'm all in, versus when you actually come around with that opportunity, they're like, ah, things change. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a great question. So what, from my perspective, what I do is I have a very simple opt-in. I let the investor, you know, anybody know, whoever I need that, hey, you know, I do work on about 46 deals per year. These are cash flowing assets with growth potential and tax benefits in the Sunbelt region. Would you be open for me sharing this from time to time? Just when you're educated about the market. And of course, if something's of interest, you can have a conversation. So because that easy opt-in is there for people to just join the investor club, uh, a lot of them say yes, but they don't commit for it. They say yes, because you know they, they want to enter the shop, but what, most of them are just window shopping. They just want to see what's out there in the market. Yep. Uh, but of course, like everything, it's a numbers game. Right? The more yep. people like to get into the shop, more people be interested. That's just how it goes. So that's our first process. Second is, um, when, uh, uh, there are variables for what one says yes to it. For example, if I do a deal in Brooklyn, a lot of my networks are me up. I tend to get a lot more interest. But let's say Dallas both work. People are a lot more interested in these markets. I've seen that investors with local presence tend to have the project which is local to them, they tend to tend to have more confidence to go ahead with it. Also it allows them to do another level of due diligence, uh, which which they won't have been able to do in long distance. Sure. But fortunately for me that, you know, once some you know, once the deal is passed goes on, they, they tend to schedule a phone call with me. After they review the deal webinar, which could be somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes. And if I get a soft global commitment, they obviously have a deadline, but this is our first come first of basis. So whatever, we may give a global commitment, but you know, if you're not able to fund on time, someone else may be able to take your spot. So fortunately, yeah. uh, we try to find good deals. So about, I would still say about, you know, a past success rate would be about 80 to 85% follow through as they've committed. But life happens, you know, for some yep. reason, some people, some people chase their buy, you know, they've had a conversation with their friends or family, or they realize they have an expense coming or the cures in there. That's just the reality of it. So it's always good to have some level of buffer. And also uh, let your uh, general partner, or, you know, your partners know that, okay, you know, kind of under promise and over deliver to them so that they know that fund allocation is in place. You don't want to be in a situation where you're not able to deliver the funds and time, which in effect the closing, your reputation, and you're not getting access to good deals. Reputation is paramount to this business. So yeah. I was operating that work, uh, were top quality. Now I get, I get a phone call from them before it hits the investor network, reason being because they got that conference. I've given them small commitments, overachieved them. It may not always happen that I overachieve them, but that gives you confidence that, okay, the child is going to deliver on his allocation, so we trust him. And we can yeah. probably put the deal in front Yeah, I like that. Okay. And so you're doing a webinar each time to kind of, you know, get every, and it's a numbers game. You you have a big email list. You have a lot of people that are committed to Windows shop. And then you show some deals here and there. And then every once in a while, when you actually are moving forward with one and you have a certain time commitment behind it and a dollar amount that you need to raise, then you are doing the webinar and trying to invite as many people on there. After that, I assume if they are interested, you're you're booking one-on-one calls. Yes, long okay. one-on-one calls. Um, some investors who are in your past lines who have that confidence with you. Sometimes they just you know they they just that busy. They, they they know if I reach out to them via text, they may just ask me to block a position for them, and you know I can give them a 10, 15 minute round yeah. down on the deal. Get it. This, this disclaimer, that's what clients who have known for like maybe years. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. happen with everybody, I hope so. I mean, it's so, but I, yeah. the education aspect is important. It's important that it's important for your audience as well. Uh, every investment comes with risks. Yep. And it's important that while we all want to look at the upside, it's also important that risks are discussed, how the risks are being mitigated, and what your comfort level is. And I tell you to spend more time on that because end of the day, no one's going to build a business by invest investing with me one time. It's only going to be that when they get that success, they know that they've walked through the process and been comfortable, that they'll potentially be to their friends and family. Yeah, that's good. I love it. Very cool. 
Awesome. Well, this is, yeah, just a wealth of knowledge and uh, excited to see where you've come from to where you're at today, going from the agent side to, you know, a fund manager and helping out a lot of people and, and making an impact, obviously. So very cool. Nishant, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So Nishant, so me, I'll share my uh, link with you as well. You can now, uh, you know, you can add me on LinkedIn. Also, you could visit my website, soldicapitalgroup.com. And, uh, and I'll be, I look forward to connecting with you. Awesome. And I have a ton of free resources there. Just, just if I may add, like, I have an Investor 101 course, which is just basics on syndication. So, you know, if anyone's interested, they can download the report all there as well. Very cool. Yeah, that's super helpful. Yeah, so guys, I highly encourage, reach out to Nishant, uh, Wealth of Knowledge, and doing some awesome things. And if you guys want to get a hold of me, you can always do so on Instagram. It's go to Credit Council Elite for Instagram. Otherwise, check out Brandon Elliott Investments on Instagram. And on Facebook, it's Brandon it's facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor. If you're looking to learn more about what we got going on at Credit Counts Elite and how we could better serve you, showing each and every business owner nationwide how to get up to 500000 in new capital, I'm talking two, three, four, or even $500,000 in new capital at interest rates as low as 0%. We have many different opportunities, education, and showing you how to clean up the credit, boost up your score, position yourself properly in front of these banks to get a closer to a 90% approval odds uh, with the highest limits, best terms and conditions. So check out creditcounselelite.com. That's www.creditcounselelite.com to watch a quick 10 minute video that explains more about what the heck I'm talking about and how it could best serve you afterwards. Feel free to book a quick one-on-one call with us today and uh, greatly appreciate all the subscribers to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. You guys are amazing and leaving those five-star reviews. Keep them coming. You guys are uh, a huge blessing. Appreciate you. Greatly share this out with somebody that needs to see it and we will catch you on the next episode. Till next time, God bless. Nishan, appreciate you, brother. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit brandonelliottinvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.